Yeah. All right. So what we have here is a basic model of a transform boundary. Uh, we've detailed it with a little bit of terrain. And the reason this is a transform boundary, I'm going to remove this nail. All that nail does is this holds this sliding piece of wood in place. But you can see if this represents a fault line, and we've got California drawn on our piece of wood here, the fault, the fault line will slide back and forth. So that would rep, uh, represent that transform boundary with that sliding plate movement. So what we're going to do with this is measure, if we put a force on that boundary, how much that boundary will move with different amounts of resistance. Our resistance, which is to represent friction, are going to be pieces of spaghetti. You'll see here in the little nodule that comes out that we have some holes that are drilled in and they go all the way through um, both the piece of wood and the chat here so that that spaghetti strand will work as a point of resistance. And all we've done is, is we've marked up here in the front where the front of the plate stands so that we can measure from this point forward and see how much that plate has moved. And we can use a comparison here. So I'm going to place it on a flat surface. I'm going to apply pressure to the back of this until that breaks. And what I can do is, is I can take a ruler and I can actually measure the distance that that has traveled. I can do this repeatedly, get an average, that way we got it pretty accurate. And then for comparison purposes, if I were to double the amount of resistance or friction with two pieces, again I've got three holes back here, so as I put these in, that's one, that's two, I can see how that might affect the magnitude we might be able to say of the earthquake. So again, we're set up, I've got two pieces of spaghetti in here, and as I push, I see now that I get quite a bit more movement, so that would represent a larger earthquake, and we can actually measure that out. Finally, I can go on to three strands, and what we're noticing here is there's not quite a linear relationship. As the resistance increases, if we were to measure this out, we would find that it's shifting more and more each time. That's telling us that there is a exponential increase in the amount of energy that's needed as the resistance increases. And this is how we get our magnitude. <coughs> a magnitude of 1, 2, or 3 each represents 10 times greater. So a magnitude of 2 is 10 times greater than 1, a magnitude of 3 is 10 times greater. So that's not a linear relationship. So as we look here, if I push, I've got to provide quite a bit more. I've got about three times the amount of movement here as I did in the first one, so we've got quite a bit of movement more, and we can graph this out, and we can take a look and arrive at those, at those results. But the real question here is, what's going on with the energy? Not just how much or how big is the magnitude, but what's going on with the energy? How is it transferring? If we come over here, we've got an LOL diagram. It's going to help us to uh, tell where this, what's going on with this energy. I like to start with the system so I know what I'm talking about when it comes to the energy. The system of an earthquake here, I'm just going to put simply is tectonic plates. So I'm trying to see before the earthquake occurs, where is the energy located? During or after the earthquake, how is that energy changed? And we're referencing this towards the tectonic plate. So if I look here, I was pressing on the, um, on the strands of spaghetti, which was building energy, but nothing had moved. And essentially that, that energy was building in a stretching or a flexing motion as that spaghetti resisted me. This type of energy is called elastic energy. It's a stored energy. Nothing had yet moved, so I do not have the energy of motion kinetics. So if I were to draw just a quick graph of this, all of the energy prior to the earthquake would be in potential energy. And I can list this as, let's just say for now, 100%. And then down here, I've got 0% listing kinetic energy. Keep this in color. 
color tone. Now, after the earthquake, that spaghetti broke, so if you can think about me, at some point I can put only so much energy into this meter stick, and eventually I'm gonna reach a breaking point, and I'm not gonna do it, but if I were to keep going, my stick would break, and that potential energy <coughs> is no longer stored, but it's transferred. And it transfers into the kinetic energy. So I'm gonna put some amount of kinetic energy here. But here's the thing, the energy that's transferred into kinetic energy, it doesn't transfer all of the energy. Some energy still remains in that fault line because it's resisting future movement. So I might get, let's say, 80% of my potential energy transferred into kinetic energy, but I still have some energy left over stored in the friction of those plates. So I might have a small amount here, and we'll call this 20%. And I have to remember that I always want to keep an equal amount of energy before the earthquake and an equal amount of energy after the earthquake. I can't make energy. I can't just come up with energy. <clears throat> and I can't lose energy. We have uh, energy must always stay equal. So if I have 100% here, my percentages or my values here have to be equal to that 100%. Again, I cannot create or destroy energy. I can only transfer that energy. This is a very simple model to help us to understand how energy is moving through an earthquake and through the fault line.